Have you ever started with a question, and the more you dig into it, the more questions you have at the end? Because that's where I am now. Let me explain. It all started when there were a load of shows which were absolutely terrible and complete flops, and yet were somehow deemed to be record-breaking, most in-demand shows, absolutely smashing the competition charts. Something didn't add up. It didn't make sense from all the data that we had, from everything that I see around me. It just didn't make sense that these were incredibly popular, and yet that is what the corporate media kept running with as a story, and She-Hulk is far from the only one. We had the same for Velma. Demand surge is 127%, a critic-defying win for HBO Max. In fact, Velma became the ultimate paradox as demand soars, but thousands of negative reviews flood in. This is a situation repeated time and time again. Everybody hates the thing, but apparently it's more in demand than ever. And those words, in demand, are very important, and they're seen everywhere. And it doesn't matter how nonsensical those words in demand actually are. I mean, Velma was so much of an ultimate paradox, it was so popular that HBO Max started to cancel all of its other Scooby-Doo series. Even up until a few days ago, where it cancelled one in mid-production. But no, Velma was so popular that we have to cancel everything related to it in any way, shape, or form. This is something that simply doesn't happen in the industry. It certainly didn't happen for Harry Potter. Hogwarts Legacy became a surprise smash success, and immediately everybody doubled down. We're making more games, we're making DLC, there's movies, TV series in the works, all of a sudden, because it was actually genuinely popular. And if that's the reaction of something which is objectively popular with sales, then why are these shows getting cancelled when they're related to something which apparently became a critic-defying win for HBO Max? Why, when Amazon's Wheel of Time was the biggest new series in the US last year, have we not heard anything about it since? Where are the games and merchandise for that? And even Amazon's Rings of Power debuts as number three most in-demand show tops the charts, which later got retconned to demand for Lord of the Rings Rings of Power only spiked after the season finale. Particularly strange, isn't it? This show only became a success after it finished. Who were all these people that were just waiting for the show to end, before they all decided, en masse, at the same time, to watch it all of a sudden, now everything's over? And we're not talking about a small number of people here, no. Apparently, the demand spiked a whopping 55.7 times after the series was already over. And of course, this post-finale spike out of nowhere, magically, bodes well for season two. Now, I've had problems with these stories for quite a while, and it led to a few questions. Who's doing this? How are you coming up with the information? And most importantly, what do you get out of it? But at least before, it had just been my opinion. I thought the statistics were wrong. But that all came to a head very recently with Gotham Knights, when we had objective reality smacking the data in the face. I mean, when you've got Gotham Knights bad reviews, haven't stopped demand from viewers, I'm not just calling snake oil, I'm calling unicorn oil at this point. Because Gotham Knights isn't like Rings of Power. It's not a streaming TV show, it's on network television. And that means we have actual, objective viewer information about this stuff. You can't weasel your way out of this one, love. So saying that analytics revealed that CW's Gotham Knight series has overcome its negative reviews to become one of the most in-demand series on air makes absolutely no sense when we can see the viewers. Because it didn't just premiere with low numbers at 600,000, it stayed low at under 500,000 for its next two episodes. And just for comparison, this premiered on season one with 600,000 viewers, and Batwoman premiered with 1.8. In fact, the premiere of Gotham Knights is actually a lower rating than any episode in Batwoman's first series run at all. So please explain to me how this has overcome its negative reviews to become one of the most in-demand series on air. Because if it was true, you'd have to explain to me why a load of people hate the series and still continue to watch it every week. And I don't mean me, because I think I'm a bit of a special case, in every sense of the word. Now, of course, all of these things have one thing in common. It's that in-demand which really gives it away. Gotham Knights, strong premiere, most in-demand series. Oh, look, the data comes from Parrot Analytics. Rings of Power spiked only after the season finale. Where did we get that information from? According to the data collected by Parrot Analytics. Velma in-demand soars, according to Parrot Analytics. And She-Hulk stomps the competition, powered by Parrot Analytics. And this is a situation that will happen time and time again. Everyone comes out and pans a show, and then you've got Parrot Analytics going, no, don't worry, it's the most in-demand thing ever. And all you get is article after article backing it up, using them as the source for everything. It's not our fault, mate, they're the ones that said it. And you're kind of like, okay, it's weird that your statistics actually contradict what I think is happening in the world every single time. 
But I can't prove it because it's all on streaming services. And then Gotham Knights comes along where we have objective viewer information. And it's kind of like, okay, so where are you getting this information from? Because you seem to be contradicting all of the other stuff that I can find. And the answer, well, uh, yeah, it's not good. What is in demand? What do they mean when they say it's the most in demand show? Well, they basically gather information from all over the internet from various different activities, interactions, behaviors, which seems to basically mean various different household search, posts, reading, and social interactions. Actions. This includes search engines, wikis, informational sites, critic rating sites, video sites, blogs, microblogging, social media platforms, peer-to-peer -peer apps, and streaming. So no, it's not about views, which is what the Gotham Knights was objectively reporting. No, this is a sort of likes on Twitter and Facebook interactions. It's not actually their aim to look at how many people are even watching a show. No, their in demand is trying to quantify the attention economy. No, the attention economy doesn't even require you to actually watch the show. If you're just talking about the show, you're still wrapped up in the attention economy. And it's not even at a one-to-one -one ratio. As they say themselves, our demand system ensures the most important demand signals are weighted more heavily than others. So like watching or downloading a series will actually count more than say something like social media where you just like or retweet a post. But the thing is, you can talk about something on Twitter or retweet a post on Twitter of Valma and never intend to watch the show. You may have an entirely negative opinion about Valma, and yet you still count as in demand. If you count social media interactions, you're not measuring what people are actually watching and care about. You're just talking about what they talk about. It's the all publicity is good publicity idea, which has been debunked, obviously, even by common sense, in that unless there's an alternative side that actually likes what you're putting out, all publicity isn't good publicity because you've got no one to market to. If everybody hears about your stuff and hates it, then it's not going to make you any money, and money should be the only thing you care about. And yet with Parrot Analytics, it doesn't seem to be the case. Because for money, you need views, and that's not what Parrot Analytics is pushing. In fact, in their content valuation white paper that they published, actually looks down on views as being the current measurement system, which we need to move past. Saying the value of a TV show used to rely on viewership, it was one-to-one. -one. But if you rely just on viewership metrics alone to determine the value of a title, well then you don't capture new audience behavior. You don't look at whether it brings in new customers or encourages the current customers to cancel their service. You don't know whether that series is the one reason someone's continuing to pay for the subscription, or cancel it, or what the benefit is beyond just advertisers for a 30 second spot. And this on its surface sounds to be a good argument. And yet the more you think about it, the more it doesn't really work. Of course, if someone's watching a title, then that's why they're subscribing to the service. It's keeping them on the service because they're watching it. And if they're not watching it, then it's not helping them. This actually isn't as complicated as they're trying to make out, but this is a company desperate to try and cut themselves a niche in the market. And they've actually done so very well. Because when you look at their customer base they've got listed, they are in all of the right places. Disney+, Plus, HBO Max, Amazon, Google, Meta, Stars, everybody knows about them. And their YouTube channel, which contains such amazing content like why NBCU content revolves around entertainment that is entertaining, or how BBC Studios has become the industry's sleeping giant. It doesn't really matter whether I agree Agree with the content of these videos, the people in them are all high up in the companies themselves. They have contacts all over the place. Chairman of NBCU, Chairman and CEO of HBO Max, Distribution CEO of BBC Studios. They're a company which is incredibly well connected. It can get interviews with people incredibly high up in these companies, almost an unlimited supply of quality content for their YouTube channel, even when their videos themselves get 56 views, 141, 344, 282. HBO Max was a standout at 1.2k, but it doesn't matter the popularity of the video because they're well connected, they know these people, and they're willing to come on anyway. And it was this where I started to get more questions than answers because I had some theories about the use that they could provide to companies, and then I just kept finding out more and more about the information. And the more I find out, it was like an onion. Every layer you peel away, the more you want to cry. Because what use could a company have that provided information like this to a company. Oh no, you may think that your Gotham Knights has failed, but actually it was a massive success. It's the most in demand on air. Despite the fact that you're almost certainly going to cancel it because barely anyone is watching it, even when compared to your previous shows that you had to cancel. They canceled Batwoman season three when it started to get viewer numbers under 500,000 for most of the series, which is what Gotham Knights is doing. So why would you value a company which is telling you you're doing absolutely amazing 
doing when you're producing shows which you're going to have to cancel even if you just judge them by your actions previously. Because the thing is, these networks, they have all of the data themselves. They know whether you're subscribing for a show because they know whether you watched it. This whole idea that, oh, well, I tweeted about a show, but I haven't watched it, but it might make me subscribe to that service anyway is clearly nonsense. Viewership is obviously going to be the main key driving force of anything. You might subscribe for a show, you might unsubscribe for a show, but it doesn't really matter what you do on Twitter about that show at all. Views are the only thing that matters because it's the only revealed preference that you have of what you are willing to support, put your time, energy, and money behind. Anything else you do on the internet, if you're not watching it, is simply you talking about anything else. Either in passing to it, or about how terrible it is, or about how you're not going to watch it. But if you don't view it, you don't care enough to pay for it. And the networks have that information. But I don't really have a problem with Parrot Analytics trying to downplay viewership as an actual metric, simply because if they didn't, they wouldn't have a business. And I think they have a business that could be useful, if they applied their powers for good. Because the companies have all the analytics on their site, but it is possible for someone to actually look at everything else on the internet and collect that into a useful form. It's just not this in-demand metric. But why is this used in the first place? Why is it supported by the companies? And the first thing I can think of is that it's a situation that they not only enjoy, but it might even be one they cause themselves. Because there was an interesting thing that Amazon did with Rings of Power marketing. It was something they'd already done before with Wheel of Time. In fact, I still see Wheel of Time marketing a sort of the dry run launch for what eventually Rings of Power turned into. Rings of Power used various different tactics that were just large versions of what they did for Wheel of Time. And they were actually very honest when they launched with the Wheel of Time marketing. Oh, Wheel of Time makes a strong debut on Amazon. And we actually had Jennifer Sulky herself tell Deadline that like most streamers, we're still trying to figure out just how transparent we're going to be in the future with ratings. She says, oh, there were tens and tens of millions of streams for Wheel of Time in the first three days, but, but we're still trying to figure out just how transparent we want to be because, you know, we might want to be quite opaque about it and not tell you anything. We might want to keep you in the dark about our viewing numbers. Now you can see my viewing figures on all the videos. You can see the likes. And if it was up to me, you'd be able to see the dislikes as well. I don't know why any of that would be a problem. And yet streamers have had that problem for a long time. We won't want to tell you the numbers. Oh, they are more than happy to tell you when it's a massive success. This is a strong debut. There's been millions and millions of them. And yet afterwards, once the premiere has passed and the numbers suddenly plummet off a cliff, oh, we're just going to shut up about that. Do you really think they'd be quiet about the numbers if they were actually good for the entire series? Or does the silence benefit them in some way and actually leave a gap open for another third party company to come in and go, you know what? That was an incredible success. We're not going to tell you those numbers themselves, so that way you don't expect it. But let us tell you, according to third party people, it was incredibly in demand. In fact, after it was over, that's when everyone suddenly wanted to like it all of a sudden for absolutely no reason I can think of. A third party company opens up the possibility to bring in stats which the corporate media will take, run articles with, and try and create this narrative of, don't you know, it was amazing success. And so when anyone criticizes something, obviously people come along, will link you the CBR article and go, no, no, you're wrong. Look, they said it was a massive success. It only happened after it was all over. And it all links back to a third party site. And we know they've got tight relationships with this company because they can get hold of their chairmans and CEOs for interviews. These aren't exactly the kind of people you will see on your average 6,000 subscriber YouTube channel. And maybe like, hey, it's understandable they want to keep their viewership numbers secret. That's private corporate information that the general public don't need to know. I'll be like, okay, even if you want to go with that, why are they doing it to the people that actually do need to know? Because if you actually go into the Parrot Analytics testimonials, you actually have show creators themselves, like the creator of Our Flag Means Death, who says creators deserve to know how their work is received. I mean, after the amount of effort that we put into it, honest feedback should be given to a project's impact. Streaming networks have access to this granular audience data, but they don't actually share this analytics with their partners, which widens the power imbalance between companies and the creators themselves. Lasting partnerships are built under a mutual understanding of a shared set of facts, and the studios and networks are unwilling to share this audience data. Until they do this, outside analytics will remain the best way for a creator to truly understand the impact of their labor and intellectual property. 
This is a creator of a show who doesn't even have access to the analytics about his own show. He doesn't even know his own viewer numbers, and so has to rely on Parrot Analytics, which, as I think I've already proven, isn't exactly the best set to go off. But if it's the only information you've got, I can understand why you'd do it. The question is, why are the networks not telling the viewer numbers to the creators of the show themselves? I kind of think they need to know. If you're making a show that's not working, telling me the viewer numbers will, will enable me to know whether I made something bad or something good, and I need to know that, so I can improve in the future. And yet, for some reason, the networks themselves are even hiding this information from their own creators. And this is where the story started to change for me. I began to feel a bit sorry for them. If I was left with this crap information, I'd be producing crap as well. I actually understand the position you're in at this point. For instance, do you remember Jamila from Shield who blew up on Twitter one day? about how the show is successful. We were number one in America last week. We made a lot of people very happy. And then it turned out that she was getting her numbers from a third party source. This time, not Parrot Analytics. It's WIP Media. They do work in a slightly different way. But the point remains all the same. You'd think you'd be quoting viewer numbers from the show itself. It turns out she might not have known them at all to even quote in the first place. And she could have only had access to the sources that everybody else in the general public did, which is why she was reporting on them when she found them. Because if you're refusing to share the analytics with the creators of the shows, then you're probably not going to share them with the actors either. Now, Parrot Analytics is a company which says they take data from all over the internet and then weight it. Basically means they take various different signals and just give it an arbitrary multiplier to what they think is important to come out with a result at the end. But as you're in the control of the weighting and any importance that you decide to give something is literally an arbitrary number that you've made up, you can kind of make the data say whatever you want. And with statistics, garbage in means garbage out. And I think the best example of that came from Amazon themselves when it came to Rings of Power. If you remember this article, where it said Amazon Insider says its $1 billion Rings of Power series will determine the company's streaming future. If we can't make it successful, why is Amazon Studios even here? With the most impactful quote being the reason why it's going to succeed is because the executives at Amazon need it to succeed. If this doesn't succeed, there's going to be a big question from the board. If we can't make this IP successful, why are we here? It has to succeed. There is no other option. With a former exec saying there's an art as well as a science to analytics, saying that the Amazon data people will be looking to spin rings numbers into the sunniest possible story. If it's not the highest performing thing that Amazon has ever done, it's a failure, but the outside world may not ever know. Lies, damn lies, and statistics is a very well-known phrase. And if you're running a statistics company, whose niche they seem to have carved out is to fill in the gaps of analytics which the companies refuse to share to anybody, then wouldn't it make sense that the data you're trying to share is not only beneficial to them, as they're the ones you want to pay you for your service, but also if that company has a certain idea or value that they want to push out into the world, then it would make sense that your data supported that as well. And Parrot Analytics from the videos that I've seen definitely seem to share the values of Hollywood, even calling certain issues a moral question despite the fact they're meant to be talking about unbiased data. And you don't want to undervalue the impact that something this can have, that titles can have. Many people only read the headline of an article to begin with. People just don't have time to read everything that's produced on the internet. Perfectly understandable. But it also offers social proof. And for the power of social proof, you only need to look at what's happening with Twitter and blue check marks. Because Twitter decided it was going to stop giving out blue check marks and said anyone who paid $8 could get it themselves. And it made many celebrities bad, even with William Shatner coming out. Obviously, all of these celebrities, they can pay $8 a month. It's not about the money. It's about the value. It's exclusivity that gives something value. If something is rare, it's going to be worth more. And the check mark was rare. It was a status symbol. And now you're not only removing that status from them, but you're making them pay even an arbitrary fee to have less status than they were before. Before they were special, and now they're just one of the plebs. It's not the $8 they're mad about, it's the loss of status that they have no way of clawing back. And social proof matters. It's been used in marketing for a long time, but especially when it comes to digital marketing. You've probably seen the adverts where it's got the review score. Anything that's linked to a brand or an authoritative brand it converts at a higher rate than something that doesn't. This is why companies will pay for a winner of X category, even if that category was completely fabricated by something and doesn't really exist. Just the fact that they've won an award does make people more inclined to go and buy that product or watch that TV show. Humans are incredibly influenced by social proof. This is why influencer marketing is a thing to begin with. 
Because if you like a personality, if you watch somebody regularly and then they recommend something, you're more likely to buy the product they're recommending than if you were just walking along the street and somebody approached you cold. Now apply that to television. If you're not willing to put the viewer data out there, somebody will be because people want data. People want to know objectively how well a show is doing. And then you end up with titles from Yahoo Entertainment. You've got MovieWeb, CBR, Deadline. All of these sites come out and they report on one single set of data that a third party that isn't even you has done. And suddenly you've got the corporate press on your side telling everybody how successful your TV show is and you didn't have to lift a finger. A TV show can get all of that social proof and it's social proof they wouldn't have gotten if they'd actually published the viewer figures themselves. Because if they were crap, that would have been the story. But with a third party, who knows what their results are gonna say. Their results can actually contradict the reality of the viewing figures, as we see with Gotham Knights, and say that something is a massive success. And that becomes the story in the press. The press which most people will see, unless they physically go and look up the actual numbers themselves. Numbers which aren't even available for TV streaming shows. So third party analytic companies definitely have some kind of forward-facing pressure to us to give some kind of story about what they found. But we're still not making them any money, we're not paying for their services, and for that, you need to sign up to their subscription services, and that means they need money from the entertainment industry itself. That means the people like they list on their site, as well as the creators of the shows themselves, because apparently they're being kept in the dark by the very networks who buy their TV shows in the first place. Now, Parrot Analytics does have various different products that they provide, such as this $99 a month one for Demand 360 Lite, which seems to be the generic catch-all service that provides for just people in the public. And then they've got all these others. Now, the interesting thing about these is if you just click one, it's like, oh yeah, we can do this, but contact us. Movie evaluation, contact us. Brand affinity, contact us. Consumption affinity, contact us. Oh, we have loads of different products that we sell. Um, but if you want a price for them, you're, you're gonna have to get in touch with us. Now, I'm a firm believer in that if you have to ask for a price, you can't afford it. And it doesn't strike me that these kind of packages are meant for the normal person. No, definitely the major corporation these are for. We'll get data specifically custom to you, and it's gonna cost a lot of money. And when you can just do interviews with the chairman and CEO of HBO Max, I think we can safely assume they've got some massive customers under their belt. And at that point, the story flips. You're not trying to alter public opinion. Now, you're actually talking to the people who make the shows in the first place. This kind of data changes what shows get renewed and what shows get made in the first place. It's actually significant power if you're the one providing the data that people are listening to. And they say they do things like brand affinity, allows a company to discover which TV shows or movies resonate the most with a brand, determine the size of an audience overlap for maximum impact. There is a lot of very opaque corporate speak throughout all of this marketing and allows you to discover new content opportunities, discover the relationship between audience demand and title supply, start developing content that audiences want in genres that are currently undersupplied to maximize strategic growth opportunities. In other words, don't worry, we'll be telling you the kind of things that you need to prioritize in your TV because trust us, bro, we know what those people over there want, we promise. And that's where it gets even more interesting when you find out exactly what they think the audience wants. Because as I've said, it seems that they just 100% agree with the direction that Hollywood is going. Despite the fact that Hollywood is driving themselves into the ground. We're gonna look at what these trends reveal about whether gains are being made that are leading the market's demand for equity in terms of representation. But what does this mean for on-screen equity in terms of the representation of older women? And in this, I'm just scratching the surface of what they do because it seems to be quite a complex company overall, but it is a company which says that the CW has created a brand of understanding popular and youth culture, which in turn are drivers of general mainstream culture. I don't know, do you really want the CW to be driving general mainstream culture? And when you're saying that The Flash has shaped the network's reputation, I don't exactly disagree with you, I just question whether that's a good thing. And even when they compare that to other CW titles, they're actually saying for the time period, it's actually more in demand than Supernatural, which admittedly had finished a couple of years before this, but still, more than Supernatural. And that Supergirl was actually less popular than Legacies, and only barely more popular than DC's Legends of Tomorrow. And I could try and find more about that, but this video is probably long enough as it is. <laughs> Which is why I should probably leave the video I was going to go through for another time. What it did teach me though, and as you can see from these clips. So now, why do the talent demographics and representation matter? Well, moral judgments aside, I'll leave those for um, another conversation. Thing that I found that was very surprising and a little bit disheartening, I guess, is that we are seeing some of those gains in terms of gender, diversity, age starting to erode in 2022. Is that it really doesn't seem to be objective about the data they're presenting. 
You don't tend to use the things, oh, well, unfortunately, this is happening. I don't want to talk about the morality of this. A data company should just reflect reality. It shouldn't be trying to change it in some way or have some perceived outcome that they want the numbers to reflect, especially when your numbers are things that you've weighted yourself and so you can make them say whatever you want. And if you deal with data, you should be neutral about it because otherwise it very quickly turns into activism. And I think the more I dug in, the more I realized if I was working off the data that was being provided to these companies, I'd be making terrible decisions as well. In the US, they obviously need to cater to a very diverse audience, right? And for a more global audience. So perhaps the focus on racial and ethnic diversity may not be as top of mind. And I think most people would agree Hollywood hasn't lived in reality for a long time. They've been in a bubble full of yes men. But when you start to look at data and information, which is meant to measure the rest of the world outside of your bubble, and you still get yes men, then you are really doubling down on a problem, especially when they get upset about the direction of the data they've uncovered. Well, moral judgments aside, that was very surprising and a little bit disheartening. Although I challenge anyone to answer this question and not burst out laughing. Did you see any seasonal trends in ethnic or gender age representation? No, I'm just a guy looking from the outside in. It's just my opinion from the information and the data that they've provided me. But I think if I was making decisions about multi-million dollar projects and what I should do and what the audience wanted, then I would want actually objective information to go off, rather than what Business Insider said about Amazon, that this will be a success because we need it to be a success, and we're gonna make the data say whatever we need to in order for that to happen. And if it fails, you're never going to know. Which is rather topical, consider no matter how big a failure a TV show is, there's always an article out there telling us just how demand it really is. You just can't tell. But those are just my thoughts. What are yours? Let me know down in the comments below. Like the video if you like the video. Subscribe. More videos like this in the future. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.